Good morning, Louie. How are you? Just great. Good. I'd like to ask you a couple questions about the history of Lock Supply and some questions about Mr. Lock, if you don't mind. Certainly. I'd like to know, I'd like for you to tell us the first time you met Mr. Lock. I went to work for Lock Supply in Dallas. They just opened a branch down there. And uh, the way I met Mr. Lock, I came back to the central office, which was 900 West Reno at that time, and to pick up, well, I was coming to Oklahoma City, and he, he asked me if I'd pick up a sink, you know, the, that they didn't have. Well, I went down to the branch, and he happened to come out on the counter, out to the counter when it was there, and introduced himself. And then I went into his office, and we had a conversation in there. But that was when I met him, and that was probably in the 1961, probably in June or August, or June or July. When did you first go to work for Lock Supply? Uh, May the 17th, 1961. 1961. Uh -huh. Tell us about your relationship with Mr. Lock. It was, it was good, it was really good. I met him several times before I came to Oklahoma City because when he'd make trips, of course, Love Field was usually the place they'd fly to and catch a plane to, to the other places. And uh, he would uh, come, when he, came, if he had a layover, he would come down to the branch. And I guess that's when I really got acquainted with him because he never carried any money. You'd always have to have, have enough money for him to catch a cab back and pay <laughs> for his cab when he came down. But it didn't really surprise me because the manager, our manager at that time there says, if Mr. Locke ever comes in and asks you to go to lunch, make sure you got enough money to pay for yours and his because he don't carry money. And so uh, I he got acquainted with him pretty good at that. Of course, I already knew the manager had told me that, and it was one of the reasons that I went to work for Lock Supply, that he was a uh, very religious man, uh, but he didn't he didn't blow it uh, during the work period. Not unless you asked him. Now, if you asked him, he would. But because uh, I can remember, he told me he says there's two things you want to remember about Mr. Lock: you never lie to him, and then the breakfast or the dinner. Bill was talking about. What did you learn from Mr. Locke as it pertains to your worth ethics, customer service, and how did it mold you into the person you are today? His honesty uh, and uh, you, uh, you knew that he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he hadn't already done or wouldn't do, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I guess the uh, the thing that really impressed me most, and uh, it sounds like a record, I've said it so many times, but what uh, his, uh, his morals, because I wasn't too moral back when I went to work, like I say, I was quite young. Uh, but, uh, and you knew he would always listen to you. He would, now he may not do what you would ask or might do it, but he would always listen. I mean, and you knew he was listening. He didn't, wasn't just trying to to please you by mm -hmm. sitting there listening. Uh, he wasn't, the one thing, he never was a person that joked, or uh, like a joke. Uh, but I would, after I got to know him real well, I would, would anyway. And I think he laughed a lot of times under his, uh, and, underneath, but he uh, he was all business most of the time. His, after you got to know him quite well before, he uh, didn't talk business. The thing that I remember most about him, he was a quiet person. You never heard him re raise his voice, mm -hmm. and he was a very moral person uh, on it. I can remember him saying uh, hundreds of times that if it's not moral, are legal, you, we don't do it at Lock Supply. Uh, that's so, uh, he was a, 
he wasn't good at talking to people, a lot of them, uh, if he didn't know them a stranger. Uh, he was after he got to know uh, to, after he got to know you, but he was quite person, and you probably can remember that he usually. I, he usually had always somebody in charge of talking, someone with him that would you know, talk, talk about lock supply. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those people in the later years to mm. go with him and uh, we'd go places. So you get it started and he'd take off from there when he got How do you think Mr. Locke would look at his company today and what would he say? I think right now he's smiling. He's, and he couldn't keep from it. Lock Supply is in better shape today than it ever was. Uh, we were always having problems from the start, from, from the beginning uh, the, uh, with finances and stuff on it. But uh, he would look down today and be very, very, very happy very happy, very grateful because it's like I say, things are going on. We we pretty much, Lock Supply is pretty much uh, stayed close to his principles and his, uh, I, and uh, take it, I think he would be very happy and I know he would be happy with you, Tammy, uh, because that, you were one that he took under his wing when he come to work, so I, I know he would be very, very, very proud of you. And as far as the company is, it, it, like I say, I know he'd be happy with it. I don't know uh, how you could improve it much anymore. And we, he, he liked growth. He liked growth, and we've can you I keep saying we, and I'm sorry, but you, uh, you guys have continued to pretty much. So I know that he'd be very happy. I know he'd be up there smiling. It's fair to say most Locke associates today never knew or met Mr. Locke. You were one of his closest and most trusted associates. Can you describe what kind of man he was? Mr. Locke was a quiet person. Uh, he was, uh, like I say, a very moral person and a very religious person. How did Locke Supply begin? Pretty much was Mr. Locke uh, went, was going to school in Norman, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, at OU. And he went to work for a local wholesale supply house, which was Norman Supply, which later moved to Oklahoma City. and. And when he graduated, and he graduated, had a business degree, but he went, he went to work full time for that company, Norman Supply, uh, as a counter manager. And I think uh, we, uh, at the time he uh, was working at Norman, they were three gentlemen of factory reps. Anyway, they had offered to back him, finance him, if he had gone into business. And probably going into a wholesale supply business then would probably be between forty-five dollars and $50,000 if you had a, a stable stock, because that's back in the 60s. Uh, but anyway, Mr. Locke uh, Agreed that you know they'd go. To, uh, he had opened us a branch in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and one reason for Bartlesville, and a lot of people wonder why do you go, but Bartlesville is a very wealthy or rich town. Or it was at that time because of the oil and uh, uh, stuff that we had there. But it was, and until even today, or was, it's still. Uh, at one time, I think, per capita, they were one of the, had more millionaires than practically anybody, per capita of wow. people. Uh, but that's the way he went. But uh, I was getting into another story here. <laughs> that's okay. How did he start? But uh, anyway, 
we had a recession at that time. The building just stopped almost. And so they backed out of uh, getting him, but he had already sold his house, sold everything that he had but a car and, and rented a building there from the city in uh, Bartlesville, which was one that he could afford. And so when they told him no, he had no choice either to try to find him another job. He had already resigned from his job. But all of, after selling his house and all them, he had $1,500 cash. And so he already had the building rented. He had a car at that time. I think it was a 55 Ford. And he took the turtle hull and the back seat out of it and made it his delivery truck and uh, for him to go pick up parts and stuff in. Uh, so that was the beginning of the first bridge he had. Where did Don and Wanda live when they started? They lived in the same building. They took cardboard and made a partition between a, a room and living quarters and the supply house. Of course, it's a large building. Mm -hmm. And even Wanda's mother lived with them. Uh, there was a big vault in that building, and it was the only, it was enclosed room, and that was her bedroom, was the vault. Big. His mother-in-law's bedroom? Yes. He, had, he would kid in later life there, said if we didn't want her around, we'd just lock her in. <laughs> and, uh, so he made his deliveries out of his car, and he lived in the Bartlesville building? Yes. When did he move to Oklahoma City? And he, uh, he opened his doors on January the 1st in 1951. And it was probably in 1953, the reason he wanted to move, the, it did get to where it was doing a pretty good business in that year and a half. Mm -hmm. He was up there about a year and a half. But he had, he wanted to expand, he wanted to grow. He didn't want to just he have when he enjoyed what he was doing too and all, but he wanted to grow. And he knew he couldn't do it in Bartlesville. And of course, Oklahoma City was the, uh, and he knew Oklahoma City because of working in Norman. Mm -hmm. But he knew there was a good market here also uh, in o Oklahoma City, and he knew there was uh, room for growth. So he moved uh, down West Main, I think it was probably about in the 13, 1400 block. The old building was there till just recently they tore it down. But uh, he moved to West Main in uh, Oklahoma City. When he moved to West Main, did he close the Bartlesville location? Yes, okay. yes, and he opened that. But he didn't stay on the West Main location very long because it wasn't very, large, it was just a, an old oil supply, that book oil supply warehouse and a little station out in front. And he used a little station for his city order and the other for a year. Uh, but he didn't stay there but just a little over a year there. And he moved to 900 West Reno, which was a great uh, uh, location for wholesale. It was right in the middle of all the other supply houses. And that's the way they used to do your wholesale houses. They, they would have one big hub where all of them were. And uh, when they came to town or come in to get it, they'd all, if you didn't have it in one place, go down a block or two mm -hmm. and it'd be there. Uh, and it's getting a little bit out of your question too, but that gave him the ideal then everybody has to go downtown of a morning or evening to pick up supplies. Why not open a store in their area? Say, for example, you had uh, 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 can't even think of Bethany. You had Bethany. You had Edmond. You had Midwest City and stuff. And uh, he just uh, decided that. You know, that would be the thing he wanted to do, was take the business to them. To the customer. 
customer. And that was really rare for anybody. So after West Reno, what was his next location? After 900 West, West uh -huh. Reno. And he, well, he went to business, excuse me, he went to business, in business, uh, with another gentleman uh, in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. They were partners, and Tulsa was with. But that didn't last very long. The partnership didn't last that long. Uh, and he sold his half of it. It later became Empire Supply. Mr. Locke sold his half or mm -hmm. the other partner? Mr. Locke. Oh, Mr. Locke sold his half? Yeah. But then he opened a, a uh, on the back side of our lot, he opened a square deal supply. And it was a cash outlet. I mean, factory uh, defects and defects that we had or some dis discontinued. Mm -hmm. And he sold those for cash for operating capital, cash operating back there. But that was on that. Then his next location was at Second and Classen, which was called uh, Oklahoma Plumbing and Pump Supply. Then his next location from there was in out of town in Lawton. And then after Lawton was uh, Dallas, and that's when they opened that. That's when I began to work in '61. In but when we opened those stores out of town, we he opened those as individual branches as Lock Supply, but it was operated locally by the local manager. I mean, he bought direct, he made the payroll, paid the expenses, and then every month sent Mr. Uh, Lock Supply a check. When did he open the corporate headquarters here? Nineteen. See, probably 1968 or 69. So, how many branches or locations did he have before we opened the warehouse? It was probably around 17. 17. 18. And did our vendors direct ship to all the stores? What we delivered those, of course, the story goes back to the, the direct delivery mm -hmm. and go. Mr. Ock, like I was telling you before, used to, when he'd go somewhere, he'd always go to the love field and he would come down to branch. Well, I had worked, they needed uh, someone to work on the counter in, in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma, the, court, the big store. And I transferred here to Oklahoma City. I knew the operation and I knew the, the girls they, after noon, at the stores, they, they didn't have anything to do. Of course, and like I say, on the individual branches, you had to do everything, pay your taxes. Of course, in Texas, it wasn't in, in uh, ta uh, tax there then yet, but you did have all your other paperwork. And I'd have to spend every weekend catching up. I was slow. The people that were real good probably could have of kept up, but he would always come in and before he left, he had always asked, what can we do to help, you know, or anything to do. Well, I didn't care about the book work. And, I don't, and at that time, we used to use, they had a mistletoe freight uh, that came, made deliveries every day to Dallas. It was owned by the Gaylord Corporation, mm -hmm. and he, uh, carried freight along with his newspapers. He'd deliver his papers and then deliver. Well, I knew they had the service in Dallas. And uh, he asked me one day, what, you know, what can we do to help? And I told him, I said, well, if you really wanted to help me, you'd let me at the end of the day take my invoices and everything and send directly uh, to you, pick up by them and bring them in and let the girls process them. That would free me up to make sales or making sales and talk to the customers. And uh, really, he said, What'd you, 
people that are talking about the office, you don't like office work, and I told him, no, sir, you could, in fact, you could make room out of that office in there. I don't care anything about it. Huh? <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he said, well, what about uh, ordering your stuff? And I says, I can turn the order into you every week, every hour, and you can add it to your, you know, what you're loading onto your store and uh, deliver it to me, uh, deliver. Because what they did, on um, we ordered everything direct, but when you're buying direct, you're gonna have to buy a quantity or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of times at the store there, if we didn't have enough to buy, we turned an order in, or me in particular, uh, to the warehouse uh, of the material, and they could. We had a delivery. They came every Thursday night, filling fillings that we couldn't get direct. Really, what it was, and uh, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't say it's a good idea. Or they didn't say uh, anything. And uh, about two, three weeks later, he called up and said, "Lee, says, uh, says, I think." We're going to start doing your book work, our book work for the stores. Why don't every day you just send your paperwork in like it, <laughs> like he had never heard it, you know, and uh, and says just uh, keep your bank account open because you send it when you deposit and send in, send it in every week, and uh, that that was a conversation. Well, that, of course, that tickled me to death, and I knew that he did. And that was another thing about him, too, there. You would do things extra that you had, uh, and uh, he wouldn't say nothing at all, but two or three weeks, maybe a month later, come an extra check. Tell us the story of Mr. Locke before Locke Supply. He, he, he was born in McCurtain, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, his mother and dad were from Chicago, but they were both school teachers, and they both were. Uh, and he born, but he spent little time in McCurtain. He they moved to uh, Eufaula, Oklahoma, and his father died while they were there while he was very young, and his mother raised the three. They had three children. He had. Uh, 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 Don was the youngest, and he had a sister and a brother. And he was raised in Eufaula. Uh, and when he get, uh, got out of high school, he uh, joined the Navy. And he spent four years in the Navy. And then when he got out of the Navy, he started to college in Warner, Oklahoma, which today is uh, Eastern. Oklahoma uh, State, or not State, uh, Aggies or something, if we go what. But the college in Warner is where he went. Uh, but during the summer, he was working. Uh, they were, us for the lake you follow it in, and he was working at a construction job. And he was working a, a lot of metal, and the lightning struck some of the metal right beside of him. They kind of got a show out of it. And he immediately thought, hey, I'm going to get an education. I'm not going <laughs> to work at this kind of stuff. But then he went, uh, I mean, he uh, started school. He finished his two years at Connors, went to uh, OU, you say that, and uh, he uh, majored in uh, business. But while he was going to school in uh, in Nor I mean, in Norman, OU, he, uh, he, like I say, he was working for this wholesale house, and when he got out of college, he uh, went to work full time for a wholesale house, uh, Norman, which was in Norman at that time. They later moved to Oklahoma City, but that's pretty much what I know of his child. From what I can find out from other people and stuff, he was. A pretty honorary young man, but he did, uh, like I say, that changed real quick after he went to work. He had, mm -hmm. 
In fact, he was a great follow. I mean, a follower uh, with, of Oral Roberts. He was saved at one of his croquet. Now he didn't agree with everything, there, but he agreed with the basic thing and the principles that Oral Roberts. Uh, and of course, Don was with uh, a supporter of. Uh, uh, Oral Roberts University was on the board there for a while when they built that school. But that's pretty much uh, all the knowledge we have of him, other than, like I say, some of the things he wouldn't want, want you to tell because he was no angel growing up. <laughs> <laughs> what motivated Mr. Locke to start up Locke Supply? He always wanted to be in business for himself, or I guess uh, in school, uh, school he wanted to build things, and then what, uh, that was already a motive. But when he uh, was uh, saved at the Oil Roberts, uh, it changed his whole con uh, concept of business. He he wanted uh, one of the things, that, the reason he wanted to grow was every time he opened a branch and it was successful, it helped in his tithing and it gave somebody else a job. Uh, and they were all successes that he wrote, but that was one thing that he was really uh, uh, true to, mm -hmm. you say. Uh, I can remember even he, when we uh, used to, st we used to buy all the buildings that we. He, he did. He had a company that bought the building. But then, as he got older, he got to thinking. You know, a lot of these buildings we uh, we'll probably move out of or something. But uh, it, but I could close. I mean. Uh, close this building or, or, or the, get rid of this building and lease another one and use the money. Of course, things, I understand, changed, have changed now lately, but he would think and take that inventory. It cost about, at that time when we pretty started growing, it usually cost about $75,000 for a plumbing branch and a little less than that on electrical branch, but more than the other two, a little over the, that in the heating and cooling. So he used the theory that, hey, I can take the money that you're buying a building from and open another branch. Mm -hmm. There's more jobs, more time, it created more jobs, and it also created uh, or helped him with competition. How did he look for a location when he picked a location? <laughs> it was an adventure to go with him when he was picking out an adventure. Back when we first, if you wanted to find a lock supply, mm -hmm. you drove to that town and found the railroad and drive up and down it and you'd find lock supply. Why the railroad but, tracks? Because it was cheap property. It was cheap property and a lot of those properties you could lease for 15 years or 10 years for $150 a month. Of course, mm -hmm. you had to build a building on it. That's the reason when Lock Supply, they had to uh, try to get as nice a looking building as they could, but not an expensive one of the reasons, because you could get uh, into a business with not having much cash, capital. Mm -hmm. But I want to add, you look at our branches today, and they're out in the shopping center. We have some of the m most attractive wholesale and retail buildings around. So Locke started out with just plumbing. Yes. Why and when did we do HVAC and electrical? He bought out a little supply house in Oklahoma City on East, Sher uh, East Sheridan somewhere, mm -hmm. and they were a, a heating and air dealer. 
Well, let me rephrase that. He bought out all of the uh, ductwork supply part. That company handled John Zink floor, uh, floor furnaces and air conditioning. But it was too much capital to get in, but we, he bought out all of the accessories the store had. And that's how we got into the furnace pipe, duct pipe, the, all the duct hills. Uh, because when we first got into heating and air, we didn't have a, a, a unit. Uh, well, we did have, even as far back as Reno, but didn't keep one that was regular. We might have one brand for six or seven months and another, and then drop it and the other. We really wasn't into uh, air conditioning full time and completely until Chuck Cross came to work for us. Well, Jim Harveston and Jim Harveston had him, and that's when we first, the first one was John Zink, and then we had a short line that was custom air, but it was just furnaces, uh, no uh, air work. It was just mm -hmm. heating and water furnaces. But, uh, as he grew and we uh, were able to, uh, that's when he, he took it on when he had the people that he felt that, that was comfortable with handling it. So we took on HVAC accessories first? Yes. And then went to equipment? Mm -hmm. When did we bring on electrical products? And what made him bring on electrical okay, I could, I started to tell you, I could tell you what made us bring it on, but uh, it was uh, it was in the 70s, mm -hmm. but I can't remember the exact year. I should have looked at that, uh, tried to remember that, but I can't remember it is in the 70s. Uh, and I can remember, uh, you, you said heating and cooling. Well, we had first we had plumbing, okay. I'm and then sorry. we had that heating and cooling, and then equipment. I was getting on the heating and air still the electric. It was it was in the eighties when we brought on the electrical. Electric. I can't remember the exact year, but I can remember why. Why? Well, we had a branch in Altus, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a little supply house there. It was electric, and. Uh, they had opened a new branch, or was opening a branch in Norman, Oklahoma. Well, when Don found out about it, that was on a Friday that they were going to be opening a house. He called me that Sunday and says, I'm going to find the building in Norman. We're going to open up a supply house, supply house only. So Norman was our first full line. Uh, electrical store and I didn't even ask him why well pretty much well knew why he was open a branch but I think they had made a statement everywhere they opened a, a uh, electrical branch they were going to open a plumbing and eating store that was the factor but the real factor was the manager we had they, they was man calling for a manager to manage it was managing our plumbing store at uh, uh, oh what's the first store west That's Clinton. Reno? Clinton. Oh, Clinton at Clinton and the way they hired him they went in that evening and, and they had hired him of course they gave him quite a, a, a big raise but they would only hire him if he would go to work I mean if he quit that day that Friday so no warning, no anything. The manager took the keys over to Clinton. He didn't even call the office or the corporate office. He just gave the keys and all and our manager over at, uh, we had a manager at that, that time at Weatherford. I mean, uh, Clinton and Weatherford and on. Uh, Elk City. Elk City, yes. Mm -hmm. But that was what that really made Don I never saw him mad. Well, I guess he was closer mad there than any time <laughs> there was on, but he was really aggravated. But he called and said, we're opening a branch and that. And uh, I said, okay, but I can't find a manager for a while. 
Man, I can't imagine it. He says, I don't care. He says, I want it open. When I get a building, I want it open the next Monday. Well, he got a building that next that Friday evening or that Saturday or Sunday because he called me Monday and got to, had the address. And he says, just get somebody to help you and take them down and make out an order, give a complete order to open a branch. He had rented a building right across the alley. From right our competitor? The street, mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, it wasn't big enough, but we made it work. We and we started. Of course, I didn't have a manager and didn't have anybody that knew electrical that well. That was at it. So I got Clyde to help me, and we hired. That's when we hired Mark Slow. Uh, he didn't know electric either, but he was a uh, one we could go ahead and get to go work at that same time that daily. So. Uh, we put it all up with the codes, uh, and it took prob it took about a week to get it all put up, and but well, it had to because Don run an ad that was having a sale that next Monday morning after the, we opened up, and he had everything it cost, practically everything that uh, that our competitor had over it to we, and. Uh, we opened up when they they started coming in there with the horse trailers and stuff to buy the stuff. Well, we would tell them, "Hey, you pick out the item and then show us what it is. Tell us, and we'll price you out." We didn't know most of the product. We knew the simple product, mm -hmm. but a lot of the wire sizes and stuff on it. Uh, what well, the customer would tell us what they had, and we would write up a. So when did you know, Mr. Locke split the stores? To separate counters. Norman was the first. Mm -hmm. Midwest City, I think, was the second. The uh, Norman store was very successful. Of course, we had a boom uh, with the sale. I mean, with the sales and stuff. With us, and most of it, I'd say probably seventy-five percent of everything we sold during that sale was uh, uh, at cost. So naturally, it, uh, I know it wasn't too long after that, after we were there, was uh, this wholesaler closed, he closed back down. He had intentions of opening up some plumbing stores, he really did, but he really put a hurt, and he's never thought about ex expanding since. And, mm -hmm. and that's the reason a lot of the others didn't expand, Norman, for example, and some of the big ones. Uh, Mr. Locke, they knew that if they opened a branch, he would open a branch right across the street right across or the, the closest street. he could get to them. Mm -hmm. And we had enough branches there that we could overcome selling the price of the cost with the... Was Mr. Locke always involved in the company full-time or did he drift away for a while and come back? Mr. Locke, for two years, was the international secretary for full gospel businessmen uh, trade. And for, uh, it was a, probably two years, he spent most of his time, in fact, he even had rented a uh, apartment or house in California because they traveled so much and that's usually where they travel from. But he, at that, during those two years, he had uh, hired two vice presidents. Uh, one of them was Dean Cox. Well, Dean, they were, both of them were pretty much, they wasn't very conservative people in anything in buying, even though at that time was uh, as, during the time that they had the oil uh, boom and we were making it wasn't a matter of how much the product was, it was just a matter of having the product. Uh, and of course, the biggest store we had then, the one that's doing the most volume, was in the middle of it, was Elk City. Mm -hmm. It was the largest in volume we had. But getting back to those two people that he hired to run the store, I mean the branches, of course, Mr. La, I mean, uh, Dean Cox, usually his primary was the branches. In the, in the store. And uh, Bill Weavers was 
more of the office, the corporate office or stuff in it. And on it. But, like I say, they were, we had, at that time, his two, when he was gone, we had 19 cars that the company was paying for. Uh, we had six or five at one time, uh, almost all the time, was at least five district managers. And hey, I was one of those six, and I didn't have anything to do. I don't know what we had them for. We only had 37 branches, I think. We, you only had 10 branches apiece. And the stores got, the branches, they get tired of you coming around. They don't want to uh, uh, come in. You get in their way. They've got mm -hmm. work to do. And I was looking for things to do. We, we didn't, well, we had a lot of personnel, a lot of other things that we didn't need. Like I said, we was making profit, but they, we were spending. Well, Mr. Locke came in, back in, and uh, he talked to some of the people, and I was one of them, or was fortunate to be one of them, but he then let the two uh, vice presidents and several of the uh, we had an uh, employee, uh, person that strictly that just had office personnel. Uh, and we had other people to set up, just go around to set up little displays in the branches. And like I said, far more people than we need. But anyway, he did come back in. That was one of the times, if he hadn't have came back in, we would have been bankrupt in another year. And uh, so he come back in, and he laid off a lot of people. And of course, that was right at, at the end of the oil boom, too. That was another factor that went into the, when the other people went. Uh, but he cut back. Everyone that worked there was affected. They took, uh, the district managers, uh, they cut it down to two. And a lot of the uh, management people were fat salaries cut in half, fifty percent. And all of you guys, it affected everybody mm -hmm. that we had, that, except the uh, just the uh, employees that was in the branches or in the warehouse. And him and Wanda came back in and took uh, the branches. Started to Don. Took, he did all of the uh, buying. Uh, he said, well, I think he kept one or two. And he kept a few of you girls. You were one of them. You were part of that. And uh, we just started over. Of course, the ones he cut 50%, even the district manager, he gave us a choice of the branches we wanted to go back into. And... Uh, so there were 50% pay cuts and then everybody else took a 10% pay cut. Mm -hmm. And he told, of course, he told everybody, he realized, you know, that some of them, it would affect them too much, they would probably wouldn't stay. And there were a few of them that stayed, was that left. But everyone that did stay, they were, rewar was rewarded. Louis, do you know who Mr. Locke's first customer was? Yes. Paul Huffman. And he was in Bartlesville? Bartlesville, Oklahoma, was the very first customer. Mm -hmm. And there's a story I'd like to tell about uh, that, too. Uh, as we were expanding, and as we were uh, grow I mean, growing and expanding and going, moving to other locations, we knew we were going to move the Bartlesville branch. And of course, we were already up to the numbers 100, but I wanted to save that number because Barlesville was his first store, and uh, saving for the heating and cooling, the number 100 for the Bartlesville heating and cooling. And another reason for that too, I, his first customer, like we said, was just across the street from him. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the branch where it was in at the present. 
So I got with uh, Paul's wife and told him what we were having an open house on a particular uh, Thursday, and we'd like to, uh, we'd like to get Paul and Don together again. But I'd like for it to be a surprise when he walks in the store. So I told her to, what time to come early. And I did the same thing with Don. I told him, to, uh, er, er, wanted him to come in early because there was a customer I wanted him to meet. And he says, well, why can't we talk about it now? And I says, no, I'd rather not. I'd rather you got it. I think he got a little aggravated at me, but he finally gave up and knew I wasn't going to tell him. So they met there in time, and uh, Don, we got there earlier. And, uh, of course, I kept him in the front of the store where Paul could see him when he walked in the door. And so at the appropriate time, well, I, he came in the store, and Don was standing there, and it shocked both of them. It surprised them because uh, he, he, Don made very few trips to Bartlesville after, well, he very, to any of the branches after he got his district manager. But anyway, when they did meet, both of them went to crying before they got it and started talking about the old times. And we had a, a cake to celebrate. And they had a, a great time. And it was fun for all of us just to watch them uh, telling about the stories of Paul. And of course, Don told everybody there the story about Paul sticking with him because it was pretty much like the water heater territory. They told all the plumbers up there if they traded with Mr. Locke or on a store, they wouldn't be able to give the discounts to them that they did at the present time. And Paul pretty much was like uh, uh, oh, the water heater bill. He just told him that he was going to trade with whoever he wanted to.